So at times, our mission is to empower the world's most important workflows. Now, our customers are typically security teams. We're often thought of as a SOAR. So these workflows are things like phishing analysis or EDR alerts, responding to threats, case management, all that good stuff. Um, but that's not how we think about it. We think about it as important workflows. So the question is, what's an important workflow? And I think that answer is pretty subjective. So we say, it's important if our customers think it's important. And it turns out that all important workflows have certain properties in common. But I want to give you an objectively important workflow, which is from one of our reference customers. So Oak Ridge National Lab, they run Tynes. And one of the things they secure is the most powerful computer that has ever existed. And so this is one that I can kind of objectively hang my hat on and say, this is what an important workflow looks like. But like I said, there, there are a lot of other important workflows that a specific company might realize is important, but that the rest of the world might not. And we care about all of them. So what does powering important workflows look like? We think of it in three terms. So firstly, you've got to build the workflow. And really what we're talking about here is, is letting people build software. And the beauty of our product is that you don't have to be a software engineer to build the software workflow. You can be a quote unquote non-technical security analyst, and our platform lets you build, maybe for the first time, this automated workflow. Powerful, important workflows also need to run, obviously. And so Tynes is an execution engine, as well as being a platform to help you build. And finally, and I think often overlooked, is monitoring. So if you're automating anything important, it's going to break eventually. You know, all software has bugs. Things break. There are edge cases. And so we put a lot of effort into how you monitor and assure the ongoing quality of these workflows. So that's things like notifications if it breaks, or it's case management system built in. OK. So this is what powering important workflows looks like at times. I want to bring it back to that customer I mentioned. Um, and this is a quote from Larry Nichols on the team there at, at Oak Ridge. And he said, with times, teams don't have to wait on engineering anymore. The power is now in their hands. We didn't pay him to use the word power, but I think that comes across, because we, we really do care about empowering those teams. And I should say, it's not just federal labs who use Tynes. It's mostly technology companies. It's a lot of very big brands. We're, we're lucky to have amazing customers. OK, that's the intro to Tynes over. And I could probably sum all of that up in one word, which is to say that we do automation. Okay? And so as an automation company, in the last you know, two years to 18 months, generative AI has appeared and has been this monumental shift in technology. I want to put it to you that automation and AI are synonyms. And what I mean by this is, yes, automation has a slightly like, historical connotation to it, like you maybe think about the Industrial Revolution or factory automation. AI has a futuristic connotation. But they're both talking about the same thing, which is that we can offload more stuff to computers, especially the boring, manual, repetitive work. And we can free up teams, human teams, to do creative work and have more fun and make more money and have better lives, all that good stuff. So this is like hopefully the glorious future that awaits us. But for us, again, as an automation company, you know, based on this equality, we have to think about ourselves now as an AI company, okay? So for me and my product team, as we've been thinking through this, we've been doing tons of building, right? We've been prototyping, fleshing out AI features, and seeing what works. And what you very quickly discover, as somebody who builds AI, AI features, is that impressive demos are unbelievably easy. This is like the most demo-friendly software innovation there's ever been. At the same time, actually useful features, rigorous, reliable, dependable features, are kind of hard to build. So there's this gulf between the demo and the reality. And I'm going to put it to you today, hot take, but I'm going to say the majority of all AI features that vendors are shipping today are demoware. They're actually not that good. And maybe some of you have encountered some of these features in the wild. Like, there is hype. Um, and I ask myself some of these questions whenever I see a vendor making claims about AI. I ask questions like, is this product feature actually any better than just opening up ChatGPT in a new tab? Often, not really. Or does it work for a real use case? Like, if I take it off the demo track, is it still working? Disappointingly, often, no. Uh, is it slow? You know, you see these fast, often sped up demo videos. You go to use it, and the thing is actually kind of maybe slower than you would have done it manually yourself. How many false positives are there? Like, how many nines of reliability does this AI feature have? Often it's zero nines of reliability. It works some of the time. So this is the reality that you, that you encounter when you start building. And I think the reason that companies are shipping what I think are not great AI features often is because they feel pressure to. 
we really wanted to resist this. And so we actually didn't ship 50 or 60 or 70 prototypes that had good demos. I'm going to show you one of them. This is a totally authentic prototype, like a, a video recording of it, if that's playing, where we were sort of reimagining the Tynes interface where you're building workflows step by step, but now using a language model that you could chat with and like execute things and build off it. And you can see it here being built for like a toy example. I think the engineer responsible here is a surfer, and he built like a little, like, like what's the wind speed? Can I go surfing today app? And it was actually amazing. For anyone who uses Tynes, you'll sort of, you'll see how these ideas could blend with it. But it just didn't work. It did not work well enough for real workflows for the world's most important workflows. So we moved on. And even when you eventually find an AI feature or an approach that works, you then instantly hit this problem, which is you're naturally going to be giving the AI access to some data. And you have to now think, OK, well, what's, what are the new privacy and security concerns with doing so? And there's all these like, big problems with passing data in. Things like, are we going to be passing data around the internet? Are we doing AI via API? Uh, is there regulation and compliance ramifications? Is this going to cross legal region boundaries? Is there any training happening on our customer data? Who's logging metadata or data? All these sorts of things. Do we have to trust a new vendor or a subprocessor? And so product teams, when they find the feature that works and they face all these challenges, they start mitigating. And they spend a lot of effort, and we started spending a lot of effort trying to mitigate these risks. And you do things like this. You add governance features. You add like really complicated audit logging. All these new screens and applications. Tons of new docs that try and explain things over and over again to calm customers down. You might have to disclose some new GDPR changes. You might try and mask the data or simply just reduce the amount of data that you're giving to the language model in the first place. And I will say that some of, some of these tactics or some of these constraints actually lead to really creative improvements. And this is an example from, from our friends at Elastic. And I think it's a really, really cool uh, thing they came up with where when you're using their security chatbot tool, you can mask parts of the data that it sends in as context. And you can choose to anonymize you know, certain fields. And this is a really, really good workaround, actually. But I've got an ellipsis here, and that's because there is an inherent trade-off. So literally, the less data you feed the LLM, the worse the feature. So there's a horrible trade-off between security and privacy and how good the feature even is. And that's because language models are fueled by context. You have to give them context of the problem you're trying to solve, and that naturally involves data. So I'm here today to tell you there is actually a better way. And the, the title of the talk was, you know, mentioned bedrock, so I've sort of given away the, the answer already. But what I want to do is tell you about how we discovered this better way as we were building, because a lot of these capabilities in bedrock only landed quite recently. So the ideal solution for language models powering products contains the following attributes. It's something that's inside your infrastructure that doesn't talk to the internet and can't be reached on the internet, the public internet. Something that can access the very best language models out there, as well as great open source language models. Something with strong security guarantees, like no logging or training. And just to put the cherry on top, something that's completely trivial to set up and to scale almost infinitely. That is our ideal solution. I'll cut to the chase and tell you that the solution now, like literally right now at this moment, to these problems is available. And it's Bedrock plus Private Link and a few other tactics. Um, but I want to tell the story of how we got there. So it goes back to the first feature that we shipped that actually ended up working. So the first prototype we built that, was, that, that turned into a real feature. We call this automatic mode. And so basically, when you're building a workflow, you often have to transform data. It could be that you've got some data coming in from a SIM in a SIM alert, and you need to normalize it to a schema. And that kind of data transformation was actually our biggest usability issue in times. So we thought, could we get the language model to write code for you? So even if you didn't understand how to write code, could you take advantage of the language model and have it fill in the blanks? And this is a picture of, you maybe can't make out all the text, but this is like our wireframe of the very initial idea that turned out to be a good idea. And so you're basically using plain English to describe the behavior of what you want. And this actually worked wonderfully. We built it out using a leading foundational model provider, using their, a their API. So this was AI via API. And we designed it. And we ended up with something pretty nice where it would write the code, show you the output. You can see here we're doing a simple version where we're analyzing some weather forecast data. And we got super excited because we thought, like, OK, here it is. We've got our first feature. We've held a hard, high bar. This actually works. Let's ship it. And we decided to add this foundational model provider 
to our list of sub-processors. So this is something we have to do as a product team to inform our customers of who might be managing their data. And we actually hadn't even shipped this yet, and we scared the life out of our customers, because they were like, oh no, are you, what are you doing with my important data? Are you training on it? What's going on? Like, we don't want AI. And this was interesting because we had built this feature with security and privacy in mind. It only needed a tiny bit of data to, to build what, what, you, what you needed, and then it would run the code, and there was no more AI. But just the mention of a new AI provider was, was scary to our customers, and I bet scary to many of you as you know, security practitioners and people who care about this stuff. So we had a bit of a quandary. We're like, okay, do we now apply all of these mitigations, as discussed on some previous slides, or is there a technical solution? And on March 4th, which was just a couple of weeks after we reached that point, everything changed. And what changed was, number one, Anthropic, one of the leading AI labs, released their Claude language model family. It's one of the very best language models there's ever been. And on the same day, it was available on Bedrock. So Claude 3 Sonnet landed on Bedrock. The fact that it was available the same day really told us that you know, Amazon were committed to moving fast with, with this technology. We plugged in Claude 3 Sonnet and it worked. It worked pretty much perfectly for our feature. And so this is a very abridged version of the architecture we're using. You can see here we've got our kind of general AWS services running in a, you know, subnets on our VPC, and then we're using private link to connect to Bedrock. And this gives us a bunch of the properties here on the left. So you no know, training and logging, because Amazon are taking these things very seriously themselves. No internet travel, thanks to private link. And we already trust AWS with all of our data, so there's no change there. There was a problem, though, because Claude 3 Sonnet was really smart, but a little bit too slow. And actually, the user interface of this, this uh, feature required really snappy interactions. It was almost like Claude 3 Sonnet was too smart. It was like too smart, and as a result, a little bit too slow. And then this happened. So 10 days later, the Amazon team shipped Haiku on Bedrock. And this is a slightly you know, slight variant of the, of the language model, a bit smaller, a lot faster. I, I won't bore you with any more dates, but basically this just kept happening. Every time we reached a small technical or edge case with, with Bedrock, the team were already ahead of us in shipping an answer, seemingly the next day. And again, that really told us that Bedrock was a significant area of investment for Amazon and something that we could bet on. And at this point in time, like, it's, it's just the great, the great choice because you can see here, this is a leaderboard. There's various different leaderboards that compare the language models out there. So this is one from, from Vellum.ai, who, who are like a neutral third party. They rank Claude 3 Opus still to this day as the, as the very best language model. Um, you'll sometimes see this list in, in slightly different orders, but generally around this. And of those best 11 models, six of them are on Bedrock right now. So let's think back to that ideal solution that we had been craving. And we really have met all of those items. So it's within our infrastructure, et cetera. So at this point in time, we felt like we'd done it. We had like a, a properly private and secure version of the foundation we needed to ship this feature to our customers, and we did that. Um, we didn't need to send that GDPR notification again because there was no new subprocessor. We were taking advantage of all these upsides. And then we reflected and we realized, hey, we built this feature thinking that we had to be very careful about security and privacy, thinking that we would need to minimize data. But we've now come up with this set of parameters that makes this just like any other part of our application. So you know we're running databases on Amazon RDS, or we're running code on uh, Fargate. We don't worry too much about the privacy within those services because they're inside our secure perimeter. So what kind of feature could we come up with if we didn't worry about the access the LLM had to our customers' data? And that's the real payoff here. It's that when you solve for security and privacy, you can build much more ambitious and much more performant AI products. So I'll tell you about the, the second, and, and, and this will be my last one I talk about, but the AI action was our next feature release. And so Tynes has always had seven building blocks, seven actions. That's what you make your workflows out of. They're the steps in the workflow. So now that we have a secure foundation for AI, how do we get our customers to use it everywhere in their workflows? Simple answer, time for our eighth action. So just a couple weeks ago, we released the AI action. And this is much less worried about the privacy you know, uh, boundary because it's not, nothing is leaving our infrastructure. And so by being able to use that full, possibly very sensitive data as input, this is just a massive game changer for almost every single security workflow out there. I'll give you one tiny example. Here we're looking at a simplified version of a suspicious email analysis workflow. And you can see we've got a step in it where we want to say, 
is this email like possibly CEO fraud? Somebody trying to get us to wire money to an attacker's account. And that prompt there, like that three paragraphs, check if this email is attempting fraud scam, rank it from zero to 100. The Claude language model will get this right pretty much every time with like scary precision, just out of the box. So our customers are now able to just use this without that fear, um, use this in all sorts of places in their workflows. So to conclude, uh, I want to leave a couple, of, a couple of minutes for questions in case there are any. My first piece of advice to all of you as like software users and purchasers is beware. There is a lot of BS out there. A lot of vendors are trying to sell AI features that just genuinely do not work. So just caveat emptor, go check them out. Secondly, if you're doing AI via an API, I would encourage you to rethink. So if you're building internal tools or systems and you're just using an API provider, I think that's going to go you know, the way of the dinosaurs. I think it's an insecure uh, approach fundamentally. And if you're on AWS, you can use Bedrock. Um, thirdly, mitigating security and privacy in AI is the wrong question. It shouldn't be about how can you mitigate the security and privacy problems. It should be how do you just not have those problems in the first place. And lastly, uh, I'm just here to shill for Amazon apparently, but Bedrock and Private Link, I think very genuinely, are the ideal solution in the market today. And they are what for us at least, are what enabling these great AI features. Thanks so much.